Good morning and welcome to Living Hope. My name is Jeannie Greenman and these are the ways that you can get involved with what's going on here at our church. In remembrance of Good Friday, we will be holding our service of darkness on March 29th at 7 p.m. This is one of the most moving services that we have all year, so please don't miss it. This year, Easter is on March 31st. Living Hope will be giving you many options of how to celebrate. There will be a Spanish sunrise service at 6.30 a.m. outside. There will also be the 8.30 service outside, so make sure that you dress warmly if you plan to attend that service. The 10.15 service will take place in the sanctuary as normal. Afterwards, at 11.30, don't forget we have our annual extravaganza, and you won't want to miss it. On the back of the seat in front of you, there are some QR codes, or they're in the chat on the online service. This is how you can learn more about how to get involved with our church. Here at Living Hope, we believe in taking the next steps in your spiritual walk, and we want to help you do that. So click welcome. If you're new to us and you just want to get a little bit more information on us, because we'd love to get some information from you about what you're looking for in a church, what you're interested in, whatever it is that you have to say. Next to the welcome code, you will see a serve code. This is how you get involved in working with one of our ministries. There are so many great opportunities to serve God at our church, and we would love to have you join us in that. If you would like to support Living Hope financially, you'll notice we passed the plates. We also have some black boxes at the back of the sanctuary where you can drop off your tithes and offerings after the service. Or you can scan the gift code on the seat back in front of you and make your donation electronically. We want to make sure that everyone is comfortable however they choose to give. Thank you for joining us at Living Hope. We know that we're going to enjoy getting to know you and we hope that you enjoy getting to know us. Have a great week. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Great to see so many of you wearing green. If the person next to you isn't wearing green, you know what to do. Hope you can uh, join us for Easter in a couple weeks. It'll be a great time to celebrate as a church. It's always a great time for the kids as well, the extravaganza. So, um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Jonathan. I get to work with our young adults here at the church. Pastor Rich and Pastor Carlos are um, in the room next door. They're leading our uh, 101 welcome class. And I have the privilege of bringing you God's Word today. We've been going through a series called Beginnings, looking at how everything came to be, bringing us to where we are today. I'm going to read today from Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 8 to 24, beginning in verse 8. God's Word says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Then he asked, Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man replied, The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate. So the Lord God asked the woman, What have you done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. He said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear children with painful effort. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. And he said to the man, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you do not eat from it, the ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it. For you are dust, and you will return to dust. The man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all the living. The Lord God made clothing from skins for the man and his wife, and he clothed them. The Lord God said, Since the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, 
he must not reach out, take from the tree of life, eat and live forever. So the Lord God sent him away from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove the man out and stationed the cherubim in the flaming, whirling sword east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way to the tree of life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for the, the blessing that it is to praise you and worship you in song. And Lord, I pray that the worship would continue as we read your word. I pray that you would open our hearts to hear something from you today, to receive something from you, Lord, that will not just be information in our minds, but will transform us from the inside out. For all those who are hurting, would you please bring them comfort? For all those who are struggling, would you please bring them back to the firm foundation that is your word? And I pray, Lord, that all this would be for your glory, that it wouldn't be any words I would say, but that it would be what your word says. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So as I said, we're in a series called Beginnings. And last week, Pastor Rich talked about some of the consequences that came as a result of Adam and Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden. Their sin not only cost them eternity in paradise, it plummeted mankind into evil and depravity. And it's against this backdrop that it seems unlikely, given everything we associate with Genesis chapter 3, temptation, sin, death, evil, that this is where we would find the gospel first mentioned. After all, this is bad news. God curses the serpent. He curses creation. He judges Adam and Eve, and he kicks them out of the garden. What hope could possibly be found here? If you were to look for hope in the Bible, Genesis 3 probably wouldn't be the first place you would look. And yet we find great hope right after the curse, in the midst of the curse, right after the fall. God didn't wait for humanity to get it right. Right then and there, he begins to put in motion a plan of salvation that he had had from eternity past. Jesus would not be revealed until the New Testament, but that doesn't mean you can't find him in the Old Testament. And I think there's two ways that you can find him in the Old Testament. Here's the first way. Some of you have a knack for finding bargains and the best deals when you go shopping. Maybe you're the person who always finds hidden treasures at yard sales or thrift stores. You know who you are. God didn't bless me with that gift, but thankfully he gave a double portion to my wife, so I don't have to worry about that. She finds great things. I don't know how she does it. Here's the second way. Some of you, you know who you are, have a knack for losing things like your keys or your phone and your glasses. This is my double portion from God. I'm really good at this. Then when you finally find what you're looking for, you're a little embarrassed and upset that it was in such an obvious place. Like, how did I forget to look there? Maybe you thought it was somewhere else and you could have sworn that you had already checked. Either way, it was there the whole time. This is like the glimpse of Jesus that we're going to talk about today. He's right there. But it's easy to miss him if we're not careful to look. If you get too caught up on the curse and judgment and all that was lost in Genesis 3, then you're going to miss out on all the hope and all that there is to be found in this chapter. Because oftentimes God works in unexpected, unusual, and unconventional ways. We don't like that, but that's the way God works. Moses wasn't expecting to hear God's voice in a burning bush. Joshua probably thought God's strategy to bring down the walls of Jericho was unusual at best. He probably had other ideas. A shepherd boy slinging a rock at a giant is definitely an unconventional way to win a battle. But God uses unconventional means to bring about great results, to show that it's him who does it. God is not obligated to work within our expectations or our understanding or definition of what's possible or even what's probable. But he overcomes our limitations, exceeds our expectations, and can and does do both the impossible and the improbable. God brings hope from unlikely places and out of unlikely situations because that's who he is. Genesis 3 shows us that God is righteous in his judgment and just in his punishment, but he's also merciful toward his creation. We can't neglect that aspect of God's character. So today we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about Satan's fall, God's foreknowledge, 
and God's faithfulness in the context of Genesis 3 and the Bible as a whole. And as we do, my prayer and my hope is that we would find Jesus at the center of all of it. He's the one who has defeated Satan. He's the Savior that was promised and prophesied about in the Old Testament and revealed to us in the New Testament. And He is the embodiment of God's faithfulness. If you want to know God's faithfulness, you don't need to look anywhere else except at the person of Jesus to find it. So let's start with the first thing, the fall of Satan. Satan had subverted the created order when he tempted Eve. He had already challenged God along with a third of the angels in heaven, and he failed. As a result, he was removed from his position of um, authority in heaven, and he was cast out for his rebellion. Ezekiel 28, verse 14 says, You were an anointed guardian cherub, for I had appointed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked among the fiery stones. From the day you were created, you were blameless in your ways until wickedness was found in you. Through the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I expelled you in disgrace from the mountain of God and banished you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud because of your beauty. For the sake of your splendor, you corrupted your wisdom. So I threw you down to the ground. I made you a spectacle before kings. And having been cast down, he retaliated by attempting to turn humanity against God. And he succeeded, at least at first. He convinced Adam and Eve that God wasn't trustworthy. He led them to believe that they were better off listening to him and doing what was right in their own eyes. He had corrupted humanity, and we've all suffered ever since. There's a couple ways we see this in the world today and throughout history. The first is think about all those who've been afflicted by Satan's rule throughout history. Ephesians 2 verse 2 says that he's the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit at work in the disobedient. Ephesians 6.12 says that our battle in this world is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Behind every dictatorship, genocide, terrorist attack, mass killing is the influence of the enemy. Think about all the families who've been affected by Satan's evil schemes. Adultery, abuse, and addiction can tear families apart. And they often begin with the thought that Satan plants in the mind of people. In a different way, you can have indifference or hostility towards the gospel. Historically, when people became Christians, they were no longer welcomed in their own homes. Even today, in places around the world where Christianity is marginalized or illegal, people are treated with hostility by their own family for choosing to follow Jesus. And that seems far away, like we're far removed from that in this country. Your, your family probably didn't turn on you because you became a Christian. But we can all think of people in our, in our families, in our circles of influence, who just don't want anything to do with Jesus. They're indifferent to Him. Think of all the kids who grow up in church. And then when they turn 18, they turn their back on God and abandon Him because they believe in the lies of Satan more than in the promises of God. The enemy is at work in everything that God has established. The created order, marriage, family, the church, government, all in a bitter attempt to undermine and defy God's authority and institute His own just like He did in the garden. It can seem at times like the enemy is winning, but we have to remember that Satan is already defeated and his time is limited. This isn't his story. This is God's story. If it was his story, the Bible would have ended in Genesis 3. But there's so much more that God reveals as the story of Scripture unfolds. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it in abundance. And this brings us to our second point. God's foreknowledge. God is eternal. He exists outside of our linear understanding of time. We think of time in terms of past, present, and future. But God does not, He's not bound by that. 
God is outside of time. He's knowable. He operates within time. We meet Him here in this present moment. And you can think of moments in your life when you have had an encounter with God. And one day we will be with Him face to face forever. But God does not operate by our understanding of time. He knows all things and events before they happen. That's what God's foreknowledge means. And it's because of this that we can say with confidence that wherever the enemy is at work, God is already working. We can take it a step further. Wherever the enemy is at work, God has already worked it out. Wherever the enemy is at work in your life right now, whatever battle it is that you are facing, whatever you are up against, God has already worked it out. The enemy cannot outthink or outmaneuver Almighty God because he will never be God no matter, how much to, no matter how much he tries. God and Satan, they're not equal. The battle between them is hardly that. Satan needs God's permission before he can do anything. And he's subject to the sovereign rule of God. He always has been, he is now, and he always will be. But what does this have to do with Genesis 3? Well, we know how the Bible ends. God wins Satan is not only defeated, but he's thrown into the lake of fire so he can deceive and tempt and do no more evil. Death is swallowed up once and for all. God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Adam and Eve did not know that. They only had the word of God that he had given them in Genesis 3.15. And there's a theme that runs throughout the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. The sovereignty of God is greater than the opposition of the enemy and the failure of mankind. Nothing the the devil can do and nothing that you can do or cannot do can undo the will of God in your life. Nothing can overthrow his purposes or change what he is leading it all to in terms of the world around us and history as it unfolds, which is the the glorification of his son. God created everything good, and after he did, he didn't step back and just give up control of everything. He sustains and upholds everything that He has made. Colossians 1, 16-17 says, For everything was created by Him in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and by Him all things hold together. God was involved in everything that led up to Genesis 3. He's involved in everything that takes place within Genesis 3. And he will be involved and is involved in everything that happens after Genesis 3. Nothing is outside of that. And he causes all of it to align with his plan for redemption. There's a couple of places where you can see this play out in the book of Genesis. But I want to look at one particular um, example in Genesis 37. We read about Joseph. Joseph was the youngest of Jacob's 12 sons. Jacob was also called Israel, and it was from his 12 sons that we get the 12 tribes of Israel. Genesis 37, uh, verse 3, says this. Now Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons because Joseph was a son born to him in his old age, and he made a long sleeve robe for him. That was his, his colorful coat. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not bring themselves to speak peaceably to him. His brothers hated him to the point that they threw him down a well and they convinced their father that he was killed by a wild animal. Now, I don't know about you. I have two younger brothers and I had some rough days with them growing up. And I have to admit, I, the thought of throwing any, either of them down the well never crossed my mind. If you know the rest of the story, uh, Joseph eventually ends up in Egypt and he becomes second in command of Pharaoh. And after... Jacob dies, his brothers are afraid that Joseph is going to take revenge on them for all that they did to him. But in Genesis 50, Joseph says this, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You planned evil against me. God planned it for good. Think about that. You planned evil against me, but God planned it for good. To bring about the present result, the survival of many people, or as another translation says, the salvation of many people. Therefore, don't be afraid. I will take care of you and your children. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. 
Now, I would have expected Joseph to have been a little bit more angry at his brothers after everything they did to him, especially after Jacob died. He could have very easily dwelt on all that he lost. He could have grown bitter. I'm sure he would have loved to have had more time with his dad. But Joseph realized that not even the evil done to him by his own brothers could have stopped God's plan for his life. Nothing could have prevented the will of God or changed the end result, the salvation of many people. Joseph realized that he was caught up in a bigger story that God was telling. God is by nature a savior. And in spite of the opposition of the enemy and the failure of mankind to do what is right and to do what is good, God works all things together for good. And he works all things together for his glory. How that all works out, I don't pretend to know. I don't think anyone knows. But you don't have to understand something fully to trust it. I don't know how my iPhone works, but I use it every day. Probably a little too much. I think we all do. I'm not the most uh, car-savvy person there is either, but I trust my car to get me from where I am to where I need to be. If God were to reveal everything there is to know about his plan for your life, why would you have to trust him? There would be nothing to trust. You would already know. But God wants you to trust in his plan for salvation and his plan for your life more than anything that you could come up with on your own. God can use even the most deceptive work of the enemy to accomplish his purposes. Satan thinks he won in Genesis 3. But what he believes is his victory is actually his defeat. The show of hands, how many of you enjoy playing the game Uno? Okay. Those who don't, maybe it's more frustrating than anything. How do you win at Uno? Cheat? No. <laughs> Have a card up your sleeve. There's always that, that one person. Um, you win by being the first person to get rid of all your cards. Think about when you're playing Uno, how frustrating it is when you're about to win and the person right next to you pulls out one of these. Now you have to wait until everyone else gets a turn before it comes back to you. And by the time it does, your strategy is probably done. Everything that you were hoping to happen is not going to happen, or at least it's not going to happen in the way you thought it would. You have to come up with a different strategy. This is like the game that the enemy's playing. He can't win because he's already lost. He's convinced that he can win. He's dead set on trying everything that he can to win, but he can't. It's impossible because he's not God and he never will be. God curses him in verse 14. Let's look at that again. God says, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. This is odd. In Genesis 1, God said that everything he made was good. Why would he curse what he had said was good? God did declare that everything he made was good, but because Satan used a snake to, dece to deceive Eve, he put a physical curse on them. Some people even believe that God created snakes to walk on four legs like other reptiles do, but they were physically changed as a result of the curse. The Jewish rabbis, they believed in this literal interpretation as well, but it's besides the point. Whether or not that's true, it doesn't change the meaning of behind what God is doing here. God turned the snake into a permanent symbol of Satan's defeat and humiliation. He had already been cast out of heaven, and now he had been brought even lower. And this brings us to our last point and the point that we're going to spend the most time on, because this is what it's all about. This is what the Bible is about. This is what your life is about. This is about, this is everything, and that's God's faithfulness. God continues in verse 15, I will put hostility between you and the woman between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Eve had aligned herself with Satan when she listened to his voice instead of the voice of the God who created her. 
there was friendliness that existed between them. But now, that friendliness, any that would have been there, would be replaced by hatred and violence. Satan and his offspring are, at, are forever at war with mankind, for we're all the offspring of Eve in a general sense. He may appear as an angel in white, but Satan is not your friend. He may tempt you to go after what your flesh desires and think that you're getting everything you want, but he has no interest in giving you what God created you to receive, which is only capa- what you're only capable to receive from him. He has no regard for your joy. He hates you and wants you to die in your sin. His plan for your life is the exact opposite of God's plan for your life. And those who oppose God, His purposes, and His people show themselves to be the offspring of the snake. You don't have to look very far. All you have to do is turn your page, turn the page in your Bible to see this in the story of Cain and Abel. Both brought sacrifices to God. God was not pleased with Cain's. He was pleased with Abel. And because of that, Cain grew jealous and killed his brother Abel in his jealousy. In the New Testament, the Pharisees are called a brood of vipers by John the Baptist. He says, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Jesus later later says to the Pharisees, brood of vipers, essentially offspring of Satan, Children of the devil, how can you speak good things when you were evil? For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. And if you think this is bad, if you read in Revelation 12, it gives us insight into what's going on in the spiritual side of things. When Jesus was born, it says that there was a a fiery red dragon waiting to devour the child of Mary, which is Jesus. There is hatred, there is enmity, there is fierce opposition between Satan and and the offspring of Eve. And it's in the context of this hatred between the devil and the woman that God declares in the second half of verse 15 that it won't always be the case. But it won't always be the case because the devil will be defeated. Right there in the midst of the curse, in the midst of judgment, God shows mercy and promises salvation for His people. He proclaims what we would call the proto-evangelium, is a, a new word for you that you maybe learned today. It's the first gospel, the first mention of the gospel, the first glimpse of salvation in the Bible, right there for us in verse 15. Genesis 1 and 2 show us that God is our creator. He's the beginning of all things. Genesis 3 reveals that God is a Savior who is committed to redeeming His people and His creation. There's three other things that we can note about verse 15. The first is, God speaks of Eve's offspring in a general sense, but then he mentions a particular male offspring. He says, he will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. That's one man, one particular descendant of Eve. Then God points out that this male offspring is a descendant of Eve. He doesn't mention that he's a descendant of Adam, which is weird because most of the time in the Bible, the genealogies, the, the lineages run through the male side of things. But why is this significant? Because it refers to the virgin birth. Jesus was not uh, born through uh, the means that all other people were born. Jesus' his father was his father in heaven, and he was born to the Virgin Mary. Isaiah 7:14 says, "Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign." See, the virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. A strike to the head is a decisive fatal blow. This is the third thing. But a strike to the heel, while painful, is not fatal. Eve's offspring would suffer, but in his suffering and through his suffering, he would defeat Satan once and for all. Before Rome ever rose to power, before crucifixion was even invented as a method of capital punishment, Before all that took place in the history of Israel, before Moses was given the law, before God promised Abraham that he would have descendants as numerous as the stars in the night sky, before God saved Noah and his family from the flood, God had already worked out his plan of salvation. Wherever the enemy is at work, God has already worked it out. That's not only true for Adam and Eve, that's true for you and I today. 
Think about where you were when God stepped into your life for a minute. Maybe God is stepping into your life right now. If you're here today, God is definitely stepping into your life. God already worked out how to save you. He already worked out how to bring you to where you are today. Before you were ever a, knew you were a sinner in need of a Savior, before you ever prayed, before God ever put that person in your life that invited you to church or that family member, God had a plan to bring you to salvation. And if He's faithful to bring us to salvation, He's also faithful to bring us to what the Bible calls sanctification, which is making us more like Jesus. God is faithful to see you through. So if you are not where you want to be right now, God can meet you where you're at, and He can take you to where He wants you to be. If that's how faithful God was in our past before we ever acknowledged Him, why would He be any less faithful to give us all that He has promised us in Christ? The Father would send His Son to sacrifice Himself for the sins of all humanity. Jesus would take all of our sin, all of our shame upon Himself as He bled and died on the cross. Isaiah 53, there's a prophecy about Jesus the Messiah, says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised, and we didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains. But we, in turn, regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. He was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all wander as we sang earlier. But God binds our wandering heart to him. God binds our wandering heart to Jesus, the only one who has ever pleased God perfectly, the only one who has never fallen short of the glory of God. We all have turned to our own way. The Lord has punished him, Jesus, for the iniquity of us all. If you're in Christ, your iniquity does not rest on you anymore. God has done away with your sin and He's separated it from you as far as the east is from the west. Genesis 3 is the beginning of what we would call the scarlet thread that runs throughout the Bible. So I didn't get a thread, I got a shoelace. But it does the same trick, right? So if you think about it, on one end, you have God instituting what we would call the sacrificial system. And it's this scarlet thread that runs throughout the Bible, and it leads to the foot of the cross where Jesus declared, to Telestai, it is finished. We see this in the, um, the story of Abraham and Isaac up on Mount Moriah, where Abraham obeyed God and went to go sacrifice his son Isaac before God provided the sacrifice. We see it in the Passover in Egypt. We see it in all the Old Testament sacrifices. But we see it first here in verse 21. The Lord God made clothing from skins for the man and his wife, and he clothed them. God removed their fig leaves that they had sewn together in their shame. He covered them with clothes that he had made as a symbol of forgiveness. Isn't this what he's done for us in Christ? Galatians 3, verses 26 to 27. For through faith you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. For those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. All of the elements of salvation in the New Testament that we get to enjoy and experience and glorify God for in light of the full revelation of Scripture, the full story of the Bible, all of those elements are here in this story. We see atonement. We see faith. We see hope. And we see security. Animals needed to be killed for God to get their skins. Death hadn't existed in the world up until this point. This is the first time death ever occurred. If you remember the punishment that Adam and Eve should have paid to God for eating from the tree was death. They should have died. That punishment would be paid, but not by Adam and Eve. 
God placed the punishment for their sin on the animals that were sacrificed. They and every animal sacrificed in the Old Testament are a picture of the atonement that God would provide when He sent Jesus to die on the cross. He was the perfect sacrifice for sin. There's no more need for atonement if you're a Christian because Jesus has paid the price for your sin in full. So if that's atonement, what about faith? Where do we see faith in this? Look at verse 20. Adam named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all the living. Why is that significant? Well, at that point, how many children did Adam and Eve have? None. They, had, they didn't have any children. Why would Adam name Eve this if they didn't have any kids? Up until this point, she wasn't the mother of the living. God didn't tell Adam what to name Eve. He could have named her anything, but he chose to name her life. Why? Because God had promised that life would come from Eve. Adam believed in that promise. He believed in what God could do. He believed that God was faithful to keep his word. Adam believed in the faithfulness of God. Whereas before he believed in the lies of the enemy, he believed that God couldn't be trusted. But now we see that Adam's faith is on display in the naming of his wife. So we have the first mention of the gospel in Genesis 3. We also have the first mention of saving faith. This is the same kind of faith that Abraham had. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. We have the full revelation of God's word. They didn't. Faith is believing in what God has said, and they believed in what God has said. It's the same faith that we have. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, You are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. You can't boast about your salvation because even if it was 99% Jesus and 1% you, that would still be something to boast about. We would still find a way to boast about the 1% that we contributed to our salvation. That's the nature of our heart but it's 100% Jesus, and nothing adds or takes away from that salvation. Either it's completely on Him, or it's on you. And God gives us the choice. And then lastly, we see hope and security. Verses 23 to 24 say, The Lord God sent him away from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove the man out and stationed the cherubim and the flaming whirling sword east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way to the Tree of Life. Adam and Eve would live out the rest of their days east of Eden. As the sun set in the west, they would be reminded of what they had lost, but they would also be reminded of God's promise that one day things would be restored. I remember as a kid, I didn't understand that the sun rose in the east and set in the west. I just thought that growing up here in California, the sun sets in the direction of the ocean. So when I had family who were visiting us from the east coast, I'm like, oh, I I just assumed that the sun set in the east. But I've grown since then. I've learned a thing or two since then, thankfully. But every sunset was a reminder of God's promise that one day things would be restored and that God was still there with them, just as he was in the garden And they were to hold on to this hope in the midst of their suffering. That's a long time to live. 900 years? That's what Scripture says. Adam lived to be over 900 years old. It's a long time to reflect on the mistakes that you made. It's a long time to be tested to see if your faith will hold up. They had to hold on to their hope in the midst of suffering. And the futility that they experienced, along with everything else that sin brought into the world. And it's In a similar way, we are to take hold of the hope that God has set before us in Jesus, the anchor of our soul. If you have Jesus, you have hope, and God can bring hope out of the unlikeliest of places. Even when all seems lost, God can take any situation and turn it around to work it into something good and something that glorifies His name. God's removal of them from the garden was actually an act of grace and security. This is where we see security. Think about if God had left them in the garden. I'm sure they would have wanted to stay there. I'm sure they didn't want to leave. But the temptation to eat from the tree of life would have been something that they wrestled with every day. 
And if they did eat, we would be doomed to live forever as sinners, separated from God. For us today, God gives us security in Christ that is unlike any other. We are so quick to put our hope in so many different things. Our bank account, our family, our career. None of those things are bad, and all of those things are blessings from God. And we should thank Him for them. But if that's all our hope is, then it comes up short of the hope and the security that God offers us in Christ. Because as long as we have Christ, we have everything that we need. Charles Spurgeon says it like this, You stand before God as if you were Christ, because Christ stood before God as if He were you. Think about that. You stand before God, and He looks at you and sees the blood of Christ that covers you. He doesn't see the things that you've done wrong. He knows them. But they're no longer on you. He put them on Christ so that you wouldn't have to deal with them, so that you wouldn't have to carry the guilt and the shame, so that you would wear your symbolic clothes of forgiveness and live in the freedom that Christ has promised you, to worship Him and glorify Him from the heart. If this teaches us anything, it's that the enemy never gets the final word. Our failures, our flaws, they never get the final word. This is God's story, this is God's word, and He gets the final say. Whatever God says, goes. And even when we lose our way and hope seems lost, with God, all things are possible and hope is never lost. Scripture tells us that Jesus is coming back. Hope is on the horizon. Our Savior lives and our God reigns. And He's with you today. If you aren't where you want to be right now in your relationship with God, I encourage you to be honest about that with Him. To not withhold anything that you've been holding back from Him. To leave it here at the altar today if He's calling you to do that. To not let what the enemy says about you be what you believe about yourself. Because it's not true. He's the father of lies. He has no power to create. He's only crafty. God has the power to create. And God can bring light and hope out of the bleakest of situations. And all of it is to glorify His Son, Jesus Christ. For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we honor You. We thank You for all that You know. You know everything there is to know about us. You have ordained all the days of our life. Nothing that we do is ever a surprise to You. And God, we're not all that we want to be. We are not what we once were, but we are not yet all that we want to be, Lord. And for some of us, we've never made the decision to turn from our sin and trust Christ as our Lord and Savior. And our sin remains on us. If that's anyone in this room, Lord, I pray that you would be speaking to them right now. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in their heart. That it wouldn't be anything that I've said, but that it would be something that you are doing in their heart right now, God. To bring them to a place where they can just say, I trust you, God, and I give it all to you. I don't want to hold anything back from you, Lord. I'm done doing it my way. I want to give it all to you, Lord, because my way just leads to emptiness, and I feel lost, and I want to know you, God. Will you help me know you, Lord? And if anyone is praying that right now, God, I pray that you would give them the courage to share that with somebody here at the church, that we can come around them as a community and support them as you lead them in this next chapter of their life. For those of us who have made that decision, for those of us who have been brought to your grace, Lord, brought by your grace to the foot of the cross and have been forgiven of our sins, I pray that you would remind us of the weight that has been taken off our shoulders and put on Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would lead us this day forward to not go in our own strength or in our own understanding of right and wrong, but to follow you 
and that the transformation that you want to work in all of us would be on display for everyone to see and that it would result in your glory. Help us all today, Lord, because we need you and we always will. Thank you for being so faithful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.